This is my Bible. It is the Word of God. And it is the will of God for my life. I am who the Word says I am. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm where the Word says I am. Seated right now in the heavenly realms, in Christ Jesus, in the place of authority, dominion, and power. I have what the Word says I have. All the blessings of Abraham are mine. And I can do what the Word says I can do. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Today my mind is alert. My spirit is receptive. So I'm taught the Word of God. My life has changed for the better. And I will never be the same again. Can you shout glory to God? Hallelujah. Give a half a dozen people a high five and then you may be seated. I'm doing things a little different this Holy Week Revival. I write these messages and sometimes I do a message a night. If they're a little longer, I might do a message over two nights. But I noticed in previous years, either the Holy Week Revival or the Week of Increase, the, the time, the length can be uneven. And so Sunday morning, we did a message that we called Holding Fast Our Confession of Faith. And then last evening, we did the first part of Confession Brings Possession. Tonight, I'm going to finish that message, Confession Brings Possession. And then I'm going to start into the next message to smooth out the length, the time of these services. And the next message is you can have what you say. The reason I mention that is because now it'll be recorded and somebody in the future studying these messages will know what we did and the outline. So don't have time for review. Pick right up. We left off last evening in Psalm 110, verse, Psalm 116, verse 10. David said in Psalm 116, verse 10, I believe, therefore have I spoken. And we left off last evening talking about how David had a speaking faith. And you and I are to have a speaking faith. In the series we did on Sunday mornings on Say It and Do It, David's triumph over Goliath was a Say It and Do It miracle. He said five times that he was going to kill Goliath. And then he didn't act like a charismatic and just say it five times and expect God to do it. He went out and took action, and he got her done. Amen. Amen. Amen? Now, you may be here this evening or watching online and think, well, that wasn't very nice of him. Well, it never ceases to amaze me in 2021 how sissy Christians think they're going to die and go to heaven and live in a, a mansion next to David or Benaiah or any of the mighty men. I mean, if you read the Bible and you're offended, you need to get saved. Amen. Tell your neighbor, if you read the Bible, read the Bible and you get, offended, you get offended, you need to get saved. To get saved. Amen. Amen. Now, on the way over here, I was in a vehicle that doesn't have a USB drive and it, it operates by Bluetooth and I don't really have all total control of what's coming on and I'm listening to, but... Kenneth Hagin came on, and uh, he said a few things, and I'm pulling out of the driveway, and I thought to myself, none of this is really very hard. But you have to have revelation on it, and you have to take action on it. It's not very complicated. You've heard me tell the story a thousand times. Maybe now we're up to 2,000 times. <laughs> that in 1989, I was tired of not ever having any money. At prayer, I, w I thought I was praying, but I wasn't praying. I was complaining. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, son, you, you don't ever have any money because you never save any money. So 
if the Lord ever speaks to you and what you think you heard does not line up with the written word of God, forget about it. But if what you think the Lord said to you in prayer lines up with the written word of God, that's your rhema Christos and you ought to run with it. Well, I knew that saving money is all over the book of Proverbs. And so I began taking action. Now think about it. I'm pulling out of my driveway coming over here. Dad Hagen is teaching whatever he's teaching in the car. And I thought about this, that I, Sue and I got to the party late. Now you don't, you can't imagine what I'm saying. You have no idea how blessed you are to sit here at your age and hear this because hopefully you won't go to the party late. But think about it. We didn't own a new car until we were 35 years old. But what was the time frame? We didn't own a new car until 1991, but it was just two years earlier. It was just two years earlier. It was just two years earlier that I'm at prayer and I thought I was praying, but I wasn't praying, I was complaining and I told God I was tired of not ever having any money. You're, you're, you have no idea how blessed you are to sit here and hear this because if you will get the revelation and take action on the revelation, your circumstances could be entirely different Amen. two years hence. Amen. Just two years hence. Amen. I mean, it's amazing what God can do when and if we'll cooperate with him. But we have to have a saying faith. <laughs> it's in my notes later this week, but I'm going to go ahead and say it now because he wants me to. When, when I say something like we have to have a saying faith, you know what amazes me? I'm 65 years old. I've been preaching the gospel 47 years. I've been teaching stuff like this forever, seems to me. And I never cease to be amazed at how when I come to 5 a.m. prayer at 5 o'clock on Friday or 5 o'clock on Saturday, how many people pray silently? <laughs> well, I just don't believe I have to pray out loud. Well, you know, just do without. Because you praying silently doesn't impact what kind of car I drive. You praying silently doesn't impact what house I go home to. Well, I just don't believe, here we go again. I just don't believe I have to. Well, do whatever you want to do. But I'm saying, didn't we cover this last year? You can believe it, but you still have to say it. Faith, this is it from last year. Faith will work by praying it, or faith will work by saying it, but when you pray it, you still have to say it. Isn't that what we dealt with last year? Amen. Right. Because we're talking about confessions. David, I didn't bring the reference, but David said, I recite my verses for my king. That lines up with 1 John on how we know we receive because we pray according to the written word of God. We recite our verses for our king. I thought it was so great at the noon hour, Austin was talking about how when we, when we latched onto this, you can't relate to it. Nobody here can relate to it. But, but we were so, I don't know, busted, I guess you'd say. Uh, uh, our, big, our big first faith confession was to pray over our food. Thank you, Father God. We can eat where we want, when we want, order what we want, and pay cash. That was the first insurmountable hill we climbed being able to eat out you can't picture it you cannot picture what I'm talking about see it's too bad we don't have a video of that old used El Dorado breaking down on I-30 me putting Sue in the driver's seat because there was a gas station at the end of the ramp on on the service road at the at the exit and me pushing that old used El Dorado down the, the shoulder and Sue driving it with the kids in the back seat. You can't picture it. It's too bad we don't have a video. 
But that's, that's where we were. And the shame of it is none of this stuff's complicated. But you have to have revelation on it, see? And, and all you preachers doing your social justice warriorism and all of that, your, your soul's in jeopardy. You may not make the rapture because you, you're, you could teach God's people how to get healed. You could teach God's people how to get their needs met and how to have a better life. But you're doing all this non-gospel, non-Bible stuff. Amen. Because these are God's people. Amen. And God wants them healed. Amen. These are God's people. Yeah. And God wants their, them to be blessed financially. But there's a way to go about it. There's a way to get our prayers answered. And it's not just doing our own thing. It is knowing how, as God's faith people, to approach a faith God. Because He is a faith God. And we are to be a faith people of a faith God. Amen. Now, for us as believers, an affirmation or confession is an affirmation of our faith. Now get this, positive or negative, we walk in the fruit of our confession every day of our lives. Positive or negative, we walk in the fruit of our confession every day of our lives. Proverbs 18.21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. I always thought it was interesting Solomon didn't say life and death are in the power of the tongue. And a lot of times when people quote Proverbs 18.21, they quote, they quote it wrong and they say, life and death are in the power of the tongue. That's not what Solomon said. Solomon said, death, and almost like it's in parentheses, death and life are in the power of the tongue because death is the default of the human mouth. And the reason is because of the seed of Adam. Now, you know as well as I do that we, cont we are continually affirming something. We are always confessing something. And that affirmation and the reactions of the affirmation upon our lives are sometimes very disastrous. You know the effects of the words of loved ones upon you. Well, the effects of your own words upon you are just as strong or stronger than the effects of words from loved ones upon you. Some people continually say, I can't do that. I just can't do it. I don't have the strength to do it, or I can't afford that. When you confess you can't do something, or you can't handle something, or you can't afford something, you can literally feel your strength, your physical energy, and your mental efficiency oozing away and leaving you weak and full of indecision and doubt, and your efficiency is gone. He's reminding me of a time in my life when I was able to go to Neiman Marcus and I bought an Armani suit on last call. I was probably about half off. And so the next time last call came up, I thought, well, I'll go look and get me another one. And I go over. Well, of course, everything was picked over. And it was a bunch of nothing. And so, you know, I'm there. So I wandered over to the new arrivals. And I'm looking at this stuff. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, they know the prices. And the salesman came over and he said, would you like to try one of those on, sir? And I said, oh, my God, I can't afford one of these. And as harsh as I have ever been rebuked in my entire life, the Holy Spirit spoke to me at Neiman Marcus. He can talk to you anywhere. <laughs> and he said to me, as long as you live from, your, from this day to your last day, I don't ever want to hear those words come out of your mouth again that you can't afford something. Amen. And God, you know, by obeying, see, I, that was revelation. That was a rhema Christos. And by me getting revelation and then taking action on that revelation, I mean, if, if they gifted me one of those suits today, I'd give it away. I mean, I, I wouldn't wear that. Not, not in 2021. See, your whole life can change in, in, a, in a two years. You could be sitting here, if the Lord tarries, if the Lord tarries, you could be sitting here in Holy Week Revi Revival 2023 and you, you, in an entirely different set of circumstances than you are right here tonight. Amen. But we can't get there through our own natural thinking. We can't get there doing things the way we've been doing them. 
Amen. Amen. You got to change. You got to change. I mean, you know, I'm working on what I challenged you all to do two years ago. You know, get the excess weight off. And I'm just a little better than halfway to where I want to be. But think about it. You know, I told Austin before we came out here, I said, I haven't had a pizza in five months. Five months, we got to go to Joe's, you know, Friday night. (laughs) But see, how could I keep doing what I was doing and then be shocked I can't change my life? Do you see that? So if I want to change my life, well, I got I to gotta change what I've been doing. And if you're here tonight and you're tired of having jumper cables in your trunk or you're tired of having some old house where stuff's always breaking down or, or whatever it is and everything except being tired of wife, your wife, that's a whole different series. We got to, you know, that's a whole, you got to get uh, the successful marriage off the app. Uh, we're not talking about that, but you got to change what you've been doing. Actually, if you're tired of your wife, you got to change what you've been doing. So I guess it's the same truth no matter what. Because you got the wife you created. Amen? I say that. I've met some ones that were crazy out of the box. You see, an affirmation, a confession, is the expression of our faith. And this is what makes confession so dangerous because when we're in in an emergency or a car wreck or in a plane and it's not doing right whatever comes out of your mouth is what's in your heart and that's why we have to focus and batten down the hatches and, and, and put a a governor on our mouths all the time so that we will use confession to retrain the human spirit. So when we're in a jam or an emergency or a cash crunch, we don't blurt out what we're afraid of. We might think about something fearful but we will have so trained ourselves that we don't allow it to come out of our mouth. See, what what, what you underestimate is that you are a descendant of Adam. And God gave Adam authority over this planet. Adam was the God, little G-O-D, of this world. God gave him authority, and he sold out to the devil. That's why Paul in the New Testament calls Satan the God of this world. Now, Adam didn't have a moral right to do that, but he had a legal right to do that. But there is a remnant of authority in us as human beings. We have authority. We have authority. But if if there's no revelation, if nobody ever teaches you the authority that you have as a son of God, yes, but you have authority even as a son of Adam. I mean, think about it. Most of the animals on the planet are afraid of human beings. Why is that? Most of the animals on the planet are afraid of human beings. Why is that? There is a residual authority of Adam in each of us as human beings. But then as believers, we we come into a revelation on the Word of God and we can exercise authority in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth then we really have authority. Every affirmation or confession is the expression of our faith. Whether we have faith in ourselves and loved ones, in the Bible or its author, or whether we have faith in disease, in failure, and in weakness. Austin was doing such a great job at the noon hour talking about how we know people that we love and they have faith in this virus. See, whatever is in your heart is betrayed by what's coming out of your mouth. Whether we have faith in ourselves or a loved one or the Bible or its author or whether we have faith in disease, in failure, and in weakness, we are constantly affirming our faith in something by our confession. 
we say we can't do something or we can't handle something, and what we say comes to pass. We never give it a second thought. See, the negative man never gives a second thought to what's coming out of his mouth. The negative woman never gives a second thought to the, the, the concept that they're actually prophesying over their own lives. And people do it all the time. People do it all the time. We, we don't correct them because, we, you know, we don't want to be perceived as a pest or a nuisance, but it's amazing. I mean, we stood right out there and a, a member of this church told me and Pastor Sue that with her daughter standing right there told us that her daughter ate like a dog. A member of this church. It's amazing what comes out of people's mouths. Truly, it is amazing what comes out of people's mouths. And they don't give it a second thought. See, the easy thing is to be a slob with your speech. What do I mean by that? Careless. It takes effort to be self-aware of what's coming out of your mouth. And, you know, sometimes just like, like Solomon said about eating, put a throat to your knife. Sometimes we just need to put a hand over our mouth. Or like, you know, I gave the illustration last evening. Sue pointed at me and said, brother, whatever, is it, whatever you're thinking, don't say it. Because sometimes husbands and wives can help each other because we see the expression on the other one's face and we know there's not a positive confession about to come out here. So we can help each other, not judge and not condemn. We can help each other. When we first started down this road in 1989 in earnest, you know, the children were learning the same thing in children's church. And so, you know, I might have said something negative and I'd hear a little voice from the back seat say, is that what you want? And I would say, well, no. And they would say, well, then why would you say that? Amen. So we even got help from the back seat. <laughs> but it was all, you know, in good fun. We were helping each other. And actually, it's a training. Amen. It's a retraining. It's a retraining. Amen. Amen. And, and, and it's, it's a retraining and even if you had perfect parents, you still have to take a hold of yourself. But a lot of people didn't have perfect parents, so then they got to really take a hold of themselves. I mean, literally, people just don't know how to act. A lot of times, well, even if they had great parents and they know how to act, we can all still improve. We can all still do a better job. Positive or negative, we walk in the fruit of our confession every day of our lives. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Those who love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. And so today we're living in the fruit of changing our lives in 1989. Positive or negative, we walk in the fruit of our confession every day of our lives. Now, people don't want to believe this. When we first moved into this building, there was a guy. I didn't know that he did this. This was his routine. I didn't, I'd never heard of him. Uh, Austin told me who it was later, but there was a guy, and he was known among denominational circles for being a pest in any church that taught healing. And he showed up here on a Sunday evening in a wheelchair. And uh, he approached me after the service and I greeted him. And he starts asking me questions about healing. You have to understand when, when Gene Lingerfeld enters into a conversation with people, I try and assume the best. So I assumed he's asking honest questions. Well, it became apparent within three or four or five minutes, he wasn't asking honest questions. He was trying to bait me as if he knew more about healing than I did. And, uh, I mean, he was being combative and still being so kind and so gracious and so patient as I am completely famous for. <laughs> I stood there and I did my best. I've got a witness sitting right back here, was there for the whole thing. I, I stood there and I did my best to rehearse the scriptures to him and to explain our position on healing. And, you know, he just ramped up a level in combativeness. 
And I leaned over and I whispered to him, because this was not something I wanted everybody to hear in the fellowship atrium that evening. Now, now 15 years have gone by. You don't know who I'm talking about, so it doesn't matter. But I leaned over and I whispered to him. I said, now, brother, really, what difference does it make to me whether you stay in that chair or not? See, you can stay where you are. Well, I don't believe that. I, don't, I, I believe I can still throw beer bottles and cuss my wife and have a happy marriage. Look, you can believe whatever you want to believe. You can believe whatever you want to believe. But I'm telling you tonight the key to changing your life and changing your circumstances. If you want to change your life because you, you're a human being and you have authority as a human being. But why would you be here on a Monday night if you're not born again? I mean, there might be... A, demon on assignment here tonight, but probably, probably most everybody's born again. So then you have additional authority as a child of God. And the way you change your life is change your mouth. Amen. The way you change your circumstances is change your, your mouth. Now, some people are always confessing their faith in disease, their faith in failure, their faith in calamity. And the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my entire 65 years on the planet is now how people confess their faith in government. It's amazing to me. People are actually angry now in Texas that the government is not making them do something. I get angry when the government makes me do something, but people are now angry that the government is not making them do something. I mean, it's amazing, but people are expressing their faith in something all the time. And you'll hear them confessing that their children are disobedient. You'll hear them talking about how their husband or their wife isn't doing right. You'll hear, you'll hear men talking about how their wife's fat. I mean, if I lived 100 more years, the thought would never occur to me to tell anybody or to tell the Lord or any, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do with this fat wife. <laughs> I mean, of all the double dumb confessions a married man could possibly make. Or how about this one? Well, my, hud my husband can't make no money. My husband can't make no money. This is the reason I'm not allowed to do any counseling anymore. <laughs> because a woman actually said that to me in a counseling session. And uh, I told her, I said, your husband has all kinds of positive qualities that I don't think you've identified. Yeah, like what? I said, well, he's got stick to it in this because I would have divorced you a long time ago. <laughs> I mean, you know, the last thing you want to do is say your husband can't make no money. That's right. Right? right? Now, see, we don't want to believe that we can change our lives and change our circumstances by changing our confession, but that is based on ignorance because nobody ever taught us this. The confessions of our faith creates realities. The confession of our mouths create realities. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Many are continually confessing the wrong things. They confess that their children are disobedient. They confess that their husband or wife is not doing what's right. They confess that no matter what they do, they cannot make any money. They constantly confess their doubts, their fears, their failures. Little do they realize that their own confessions rob them of their own ability and efficiency. They, they little realize that their confessions can change the solid, firm road of life into a boggy, clogged mire. They little realize that their confessions make their way in life harder than it would have been without all those negative words. Now, I'm going to say a hard thing, so brace yourself. Music is incredibly powerful. In the beginning, God created three archangels. 
Gabriel, Michael, and Lucifer. And Lucifer was the choir director. And I read about him just the other evening in Ezekiel. He was beautiful. But he thought himself equal to God. And he sinned. And that's why when he was cast out of heaven, one third of the angels went with him because there were three archangels. But think about it. He was the song leader. And part of the reason America is in the mess America is in is because of the music America has been listening to. And I think one of the most ridiculous things, now I'll, I'll take heat over this, send all nasty emails to Austin. <laughs> I think one of the most ridiculous things is to see middle class young people acting like hood gangsters. But it's because of the music they listen to. But what is in that music? Drugs, killings, whores, B-I-T-C-H-E-S's. Shame on you if your children have music on their digital devices that talk about B-I-T-C-H-E-S's. You listen to that, that'll get in your heart. That'll get in your spirit. You'll think like that. Actually, you'll talk like that. Music is powerful. I sat, stood right here in my own church and heard a song here years ago, and I, I, thought, I asked myself, what, what am I listening to? And then I got into it, looked it up online. It was done by a famous group. It was about saving the oceans which is Romans 1. This generation is Romans 1. They worship the creation instead of worshiping the creator. You can go online and look this stuff up. It's easy to do. Any causeway or bridge, any ancient causeway or bridge, and look it up. Photographs from the 1800s and look it up. Photographs from the last year or two. The oceans haven't risen. It's, it's just people lying to you. That's right. That's right. But we got famous, famous, famous Christians going for all of this. Yeah. That's right. See, and they gave up saving souls for Jesus to save the whales and to save the oceans and all of this stuff. They believed a lie. And then they began repeating a lie, confessing a lie, verbalizing a lie, and they've lost their souls. They've lost their souls. What comes out of your mouth is incredibly important, and what comes into your ears is incredibly important. I didn't bring the reference, but Jesus said, be careful how you listen. So I got all these young people. You want to be a millionaire? Well, don't listen to rap. You want to be a millionaire? Yeah, don't listen to rap. You want to be a millionaire? Now, now three for three. You want to be a millionaire? Four for four, you want to be a millionaire? Five for five, you want to be a millionaire? And notice, it doesn't matter what color they are, they all want to be a millionaire. Isn't that interesting? Well, don't listen to rap. And then don't listen to a lot of Christian music. We have to be mindful. Jesus said, be careful how you listen. And the reason we have to be careful how we listen is because it's going to get into our heart and it's going to get into our heart. And if it gets into our heart, it's going to come out of our mouth. Amen. See, if it gets in your heart, it's going to affect your behavior. You could treat a woman like that. Don't date a guy that listens to that. Because he might treat you like what he's been listening to. The confession of weakness will bind you and hold you in captivity. What have they got this entire generation doing? What have they got the, this entire generation? I mean, they got the richest woman in the world complaining uh, uh, about discrimination. Oh, 
discriminate against me. If it'll make me the richest, well, I wouldn't want to be the richest woman in the world, but of course in 2021, that is entirely possible. Uh, but how can people have so much and all they do is complain? But they're training, they're training people to complain. They're training people, and people have no idea how blessed they are. They have no idea how blessed they are. Your confession is the expression of your faith. We know what you believe in by what comes out of your mouth. And the, you, you need to go back, it's on the app. So you ladies or people, that guys that missed it, you need to all watch the uh, Power Lunch from earlier this month, No Other Gods. Because this country rejected God, rejected the Bible, and they've gone, into, they've gone down the road of worshiping other gods. And there's no power in it. There's no power in it. Confessions of lack and of sickness drive God the Father out of your life and they let Satan in. Confessions of lack and sickness give Satan the, the right of way to our lives. Confession of disease and sickness gives disease and sickness dominion over your body. Such confessions honor the devil and they rob God of his glory. The law of prosperity in the Bible is Jesus is in Jesus' parable of the talents. Matthew 25, 29, for everyone who has will be given more and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what he has will be taken from him. This was one of John Osteen's favorite passages to preach from on the topic of prosperity. Of course, he would use the King James Version. I gave you this verse yesterday in the King James, or part of it, Matthew 25, 29, for, every, for unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance from him, but from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. So when you start down the biblical road, when you start actually doing what Jesus taught with regard to confession in the mouth, it draws criticism because the blessings of the Lord stack up. We see this in Deuteronomy 28, that when people live under the curse, the curse chases them down and the, church, the curse uh, overtakes them. But when you get on the right road and you get control of your mouth and you get control of your life and you get control of your habits and you begin living for God, the blessing begins to overtake you. And the, the blessings of the Lord stack up. If people would only get a hold of this, what a difference it would make. I know from experience, I've proved it again and again and again. It's true. Your confession is the expression of your faith. And these confessions of lack and of sickness shut God the Father out of your life. And they let Satan in, giving him the right of way in your life. Our mouths are the gateway for God to work in our lives or for Satan to work in our lives. Confession of disease and sickness gives disease and sickness dominion over your body. Confession of lack and want give lack and want dominion over your finances. And confessions such as this honor the devil and they rob God of his glory. So let's pause for a moment and talk about what we've learned so far. We've learned that faith must be fed upon God's word. We've learned that faith will grow by feeding it and faith will grow by exercising it. We've learned that doers of the word means that we act upon the word. We take action upon the word. We demonstrate our faith by taking action upon the word. We've learned that as we, daily take, as we take daily action on the Word of God, God's Word grows in taking dominion over our lives and Satan's influence over our lives wanes. We've learned that the Word of God becomes a reality in us only as we employ it, put it into practice, put it into action in our daily lives, in our daily conduct, and in our daily speech. We've learned that by building faith, by taking action on the Word of God in our daily lives, we can come to the place where fear is totally and utterly destroyed in our lives and a thing of the past. Do you not see that the way that they have, they have 
brought this country under control and submission is through fear. It is exactly the method that Hitler used in the 30s. He created fear. Fear of what? It wasn't fear of a virus. It was fear of those dirty Jews. And actually created a phobia among the people. And, and there was talk of disease. And everything else that was going to be spread by those people. And they stirred up enough fear. And fear, when it takes root, turns into hate. And that's how they ended up doing what they did. If you can make people afraid enough, you can control them. <coughs> and fear is of the devil. You know, I always hate the month of October on all the electronic stuff because they're always advertising all the, the horror movies. Look, I'm not saying every, every uh, horror movie is of the devil, but maybe I should. Anything that creates fear is not of God. Yeah. Say it out loud. Anything, Anything that creates fear, that creates is, fear. Not is not of God. And actually what fear is, is fear is faith in the negative. As your faith grows, you begin to possess your rights in Christ. You begin to take what belongs to you. It always belonged to you. But if you don't know what belongs to you, you can't take it. If you don't know what belongs to you, you can't exercise authority to get it. We've learned that it's when you act upon God's word that it becomes real to you and manifests itself in your life. We've learned that believing is possessing and confession is possession. The moment I begin to change my life, change my heart, change my mind, change my mouth, I begin appropriating a new possession. I begin taking dominion over a brand new lifestyle, a brand new set of circumstances. Believing is possessing and confession is possession. We've learned that faith grows in the atmosphere of the confession of the Word of God. And that's why we try that every song we sing here at Faith Christian Center is full of faith. We don't sing songs about how we're worms or how we're sick or how we're poor or how we're struggling. We've learned that it doesn't work to just believe it. You have to say it. We've learned that what I confess, I possess. Say it out loud. What I confess, I possess. What I confess, I possess. And that's all I'll ever possess. I'll never possess more than I confess. Say it out loud. I'll never possess more than I confess. I'll never possess more than I confess. We've learned that I must confess I have a thing before I can possess it. We've learned that there are certain laws that govern God's dealings with man. And when you act in obedience to those laws, your faith will work. And when you don't act in obedience to those laws, your faith won't work. We've learned that the law of God is you believe and confess it's yours and then it comes into being. We've learned that our faith keeps pace with our confession. See, we think that we need more faith. We just need to regulate our mouths. We think we need more faith. We just need to regulate our mouths because your faith follows your confession. Your confession doesn't follow your faith. Your faith follows your confession. We've learned that my confession is not based on any feelings or other circumstances or evidence. My, confe my confession is based entirely upon what God has said. I say what God has said. And then I hold fast my confession of faith. We've learned that believing is possessing. When, when I boldly confess, then and only then do I possess. And we want to be timid about it. We've learned that your words have dominion over what you believe. You know, a little thing. Austin mentioned this morning that the way we began praying over our food changed in those days. And we, I don't have the, the reference, Sue would know it offhand, but... We began praying, confessing, believing that 
We serve the God who blessed our food and our water and took sickness and disease out of our midst. We pulled that right out of the Word of God. And it's interesting, you can go to the cafe or anywhere and you can watch little children pray over their food in this church and probably that's the prayer they'll pray. See, in other words, we came across a verse in the Word of God and, and it just became our habit to recite that. And how many of you know with, with, it, with such sickness out here, you, you need to pray over your food. Amen. 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 You don't know what's going on in these fast food places. But think about it, because we discovered that verse in the Bible all those decades ago. We began praying over our food that way. We taught Austin and Christina to pray over their food that way. It got into the church. Now you can hardly hear a, a child pray over their food in the cafe without reciting that that we serve the God who blesses our food and our water and takes sickness and disease out of our midst. And then think about how this church skated from this virus in the last 12 months. Because we got, we got everybody what? Saying the word. What if I'd spent all these decades talking about, you know, Fauci? Well, we would get Fauci results. But we haven't been talking about it. Dr. Fool. We've been talking about the Word of God. Amen. See, if you, if you confess what man says, you're going to get man results. But if you confess what God says, you're going to get God results. Amen. And that's true in your money. That's true in your marriage. That's true in your body. Before he went to be with the Lord, Dr. Edwin Lewis Cole called us up and wanted to have lunch. And Sue and I met him up in North Arlington for lunch, him and Nancy. And uh, he told me, he said, you do realize, right, that one of the reasons, and this is back all those years ago, I didn't think we were that prosperous. But he said, you do realize, right, that one of the reasons your congregation is so prosperous is because of that prayer you lead them in every offering. The thought had never occurred to me. How do we pray over every offering? Thank you, Father God. As I give, I have this confidence. Your word is working in my life, in my home, in my family, and in this church. There's enough money coming every seven days to meet every... I mean, I got you all quoting the word. You don't even know what I'm doing to you. Amen. And it's not brainwashing, it's Bible. Amen. Watching CNN is brainwashing. Can you see that? Yeah. And so without even thinking about it, circumstances come up, see, and you come to church and we pray over these offerings and you think, well, the Lord's meeting all of my needs. Hallelujah. See, if it gets it, see, the point is if, it, if it's in your mouth, it'll get in your heart. Yeah. See, we think it's the other way. We think we got to really, 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 really get it in our heart and then it'll come out of our mouth. That's not the way it works. If it's in your mouth, it'll get in your heart. We've learned that faith is governed by our confession. We've learned that the confession of God's word solves the problem. We've learned positive or negative, we walk in the fruit of our confession every day of our lives. We've learned that the confession of our faith creates realities, and we've learned that your confession is the expression of your faith. Now let's shift gears and talk about, in my notes, you can have what you say. You can have what you say. Going back to our basis, Mark eleven twenty two to 24, and Jesus answering saith unto them, have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Verse 24, therefore I say unto you, what things shall you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and ye shall have them. And Jesus answering, saith unto them, have faith in God. Now in the Greek it reads, have the faith of God, or it could be translated, have the God kind of faith. We dealt with this last evening. In the beginning, the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And God said, call Dr. Fauci, I don't know what to do. Is that what he said? He said, oh boy, it's dark out there. Is that what he said? He didn't talk about what was. 
He said what he wanted. Amen. Let there be what? Light and light was. We, we learned last night in Romans 4, this is who we serve, the God who calls those things which are not present tense as though they were. As long as you're talking about your present circumstances, you will not change levels. You got to talk about where you're going, not where you are. For our God is a faith God and we are to be his faith people. To receive anything from Father God, you must approach him by the laws that he has set up and he has set up this law of faith. I mean, you know, Austin says he's got a stack of testimonies like this we've never gotten to, but I'm telling you, just the testimonies we've gotten in the last few weeks are completely amazing. God is doing big miracles in this congregation. But they all have one thing in common. They changed the way they were doing things. They got lined up with the Word of God. So this week we're focusing our study on confession, specifically how confession brings possession. Look again at verse 23. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe. That those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. <laughs> you know, Austin told a story this afternoon at the noon hour uh, back in some of those dark days we went through. I don't remember exactly what was happening, but I was sitting in my office and I must have looked worried and Sue walked in and she said, what's up with you? And I started trying to tell her, you know, financial troubles. And she threw her arms up and she said, there's so much money coming. She said, the day is coming. We'll be able to paper the walls with money. And so up in my office, there's a sheet from the U.S. Treasury of money, and we've, I don't remember how we got it, but it was not cut. In other words, money from the U.S. Treasury, and we framed it, and we papered the wall with it. Of course, those dollars are probably worth one-fifth of what they were the day we, we papered the wall with them. We probably should have invested them, but I thought it was a great illustration, Amen. You can have what you say. Amen. I said you can have what you say. Amen. Notice in verse 23, Jesus said, Whosoever shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. He shall have whatsoever he saith. He shall have... Now see, we don't believe this. We know we don't believe this by just listening to each other. <laughs> you know, I, when we first built this place, I used to like to sit in the cafe and study, but I, I had to give that up because when school's open, I, don't, I really don't want to be in there and hear the way sometimes, sometimes, sometimes parents talk to their children. They get in line and, you know, children, what, what does every child want? What does every American child want? A cookie. Well, we, we can't afford that. We don't have enough for that. Or get one cookie and four children share it. Where, what do they think is going on in the minds of children? No American child is going to want to share a cookie. Especially with a sibling. Maybe when they're a teenager, they'll share it with a girlfriend or a boyfriend, but not with a sibling. You know, or hear them say things like, why can't you behave? I, I just don't want to hear it. And, and hopefully they're not Faith Christian Center parents. Hopefully they're community parents. But I, I've, I've heard some Faith Christian Center parents say some amazing things to their children. Why would I say what I don't want? Amen. Talk to me. Why would, I, why would I say what I don't want? I mean, that'd be like a guy asking a gal out and saying, now, I know you'll probably say no, but I want to check with you and see if you would like to go to lunch. 
What is the automatic answer? No. no. <laughs> See, a lot of people are sowing the seed for failure before they ever get started with their project. They're planning to fail. We know this because of what's coming out of their mouth. He shall have whatsoever he saith. He shall have. He, so you're not even going to get the will of God. People think, well, you know, I know my healing's on the way. When you say, I know my healing is on the way, you have negated even the possibility of your healing. Because that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that with his stripes, we have been healed. 1 Peter 2.24, that's past tense. So when you say, oh, I, I know someday I'm going to have my healing, well, you've negated the word of God. You, you have precluded the possibility of being healed. I know someday my ship will come in. No, it won't. Pastor, as soon as my ship comes in, I'll start tithing. Well, we can't build no phase two based on you. <laughs> Your confession is sowing. And the reaping comes later. He shall have whatsoever he saith. He shall have what, and, and you know, I keep my mouth shut. I try and be polite. I mean, people don't want to want me policing them. But even last year in the midst of all of this, people were saying, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to make a living and all of this stuff. And I just let it go past me. I don't police everybody's speech. I, I have a big enough job policing my speech. Dr. Summerall, one night, two homes ago in our living room, gave us a list of things to never confess. And one of them was, never confess you're confused, never confess you're tired. Ne he told me, and this was 25 years ago, never confess you're old. There are people, and when I teach on prosperity, you know, people will say, well, I wish I'd heard this sooner. You've heard it now. You can take action now. Amen. Amen. Don't be talking about how you're too old. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Say it out loud. He shall have whatsoever he saith. So you're not even going to get the will of God. You're not going to get the will of God. You are not going to get the will of God. He shall have whatsoever he saith. And this upsets people. You know, we're kind of over the hump, I think the silver hair helps because, you know, it's not like it was. You know, people, I think they realize that they just can't come in and push me around. But 20, 30 years ago, you know, we had people come in and they were going to tell me the way it was. People get upset when you start saying what you want. And if what you want is beyond where they're living. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Tell your neighbor, you're not going to get the will of God. <laughs> Tell the neighbor on the other side, forget about it. You're not going to get the will of God. <laughs> now, you think I'm being negative. He said he shall have whatsoever he saith. Let's turn it around and be positive. Tell, tell the neighbor on the one side, you're going to get what you say. <laughs> Tell the neighbor on the other side, you're going to get what you say. <laughs> but you're not going to get the will of God. Not unless... You say the will of God. Amen. If you want the will of God, you got to say the will of God. Yeah. Faith will work by praying it, or faith will work by saying it, but when you pray it, you still got to say it. And if I want the will of God, I've got to confess the will of God. But it requires homework, then I got to go to the Bible and find out what the will of God is for my life. I've got to find, find out what God's will is. For my body, what God's will is for my money, what God's will is for my marriage, what God's will is for my, my family. And then I got to confess it. Amen. 
then I got to confess it. Austin will tell you, man, these grandchildren, you know, we've confessed stuff right off of their bodies. You don't say what you're afraid of. You say what you want. Because he shall, say it again, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Now, see, the problem is this is not complicated. The problem is this is simple. The problem is, though, it has not been taught. People don't know. And so the first time they hear it, they think it is weird. But it's God. These are the words of Jesus. This isn't even Paul or somebody. He shall have whatsoever he saith. He shall have whatsoever he saith. And you've often heard me say, you can have what you say, and that's true. But it's not a blank check. It's conditional. As long as you meet the conditions, you can have what you say. You can't confess that God's going to make you the biggest drug dealer in Arlington, Texas. You can have what you say, but it has to be something that you can find two or three promises for in the Word of God, and it has to be consistent with a godly lifestyle. And shall not doubt in his heart. And shall not doubt in his heart. So somebody could come into a service like this, hear this, and they could go out and begin to say, but because they haven't taken the time to meditate on the Word, study the Word of God, build the Word of God into their heart, they go out and they say this, or they go out and they say that, they go out and confess this, they go out and confess that, and then they don't hold fast because it's not in their heart. They let go of it. They doubt in their heart. But Jesus said, and shall not doubt in his heart. And the only way you cannot doubt in your heart is if you build it into your heart. That's why in the week of increase uh, last year and the year before that, and this year coming up in August, I do my best to get you thoroughly convinced of the will of God in your life to succeed and prosper. See, if it's not in your heart, you can't have it. I'm sitting in a barber shop 25 years ago and I'm waiting to get my hair cut and this pastor sat down next to me and you have to understand, I've been doing this so long, these guys have all come and gone. When we built this building, no one had served as a pastor longer in Arlington, Texas than yours truly and that was 17 years ago we started construction. So they've, they've come and gone. You know, it's like cars going down the road. I ignore them. <laughs> and he, this pastor sat down next to me at Pioneer to Church, and he said, he said, uh, I know that you have the most integrated full gospel church in the Metroplex. Yep. <laughs> you know, he wants me to engage him in conversation. I don't know who he is. Uh, why should I talk to him? He said, well, how did you do it? I ignored him. Minutes go by. And, and he, he nudges me and he said, how did you do it? And I ignored him because they don't want to really know the answer. They think I'll say, you know, wear a bracelet that says uh, I'm cool with everybody or whatever or, you know, uh, whatever. They think it's something outward. That there's a formula. I ignored him. More minutes go by. He says, well, how did you do it? And I said, well, it's like my wife, Sue Lingerfeld, says. And then minutes go by. (laughs) And he says, well, what does she say? And I said, well, she says, if it's not in your heart, you can't have it. And he didn't want to talk to me anymore. (laughs) Because see, a lot of people, they they don't, they they ask you and they're being, but they don't want to know. Because nobody wants to hear anything that's going to require a heart change. If they could change their letterhead, they're okay with that. If they could redo their website, they're okay. But they don't, nobody wants to have a heart change. 
But the same thing is true about healing. The same thing is true about success. The same thing is true about prosperity. If it's not in your heart, you can't have it. Because Jesus said, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. Yeah, but pastor, how do I work myself up into that level of faith? You don't have to. You don't have to. The powers of observation alone will take you there. All you've really got to do is to be a doer of the Word of God. That's it. That's really all you've got to do is take hold of your mouth and be a doer of the Word of God because you don't even need any faith. Just the powers of observation will take you there but shall believe that those things which he said should come to pass because you'll come to realize that they do. I stood right here a year ago this week. You weren't allowed to come. And I prophesied some crazy things. And they all came to pass. They all came to everything. Go back and watch it. Everything I said came to pass. We ended the year with more money and less debt. I said everybody who would hear these words of mine and believe these words of mine and take action on these words of mine would end the year with more cash and less debt. And obviously, people were prospered and blessed because the donated income rose 51% last year. Hallelujah. Now, when I was a young man, and crazy things came out of my mouth, I questioned myself. But what I'm teaching right now has come to pass in my life, and simply through the powers of observation, I have realized that when I stand under the anointing of God and crazy things come out of my mouth, to just stay with it. Amen. Because it'll come to pass. Amen. I hold fast, and you never saw me waver. When we came back together in person, you, did, you, you never saw me say, now look, I know I said some crazy stuff during that Holy Week revival. You, I never crawfished. Hallelujah. You pick your ground, and you stand your ground. I grew up where there were bullies. There were bullies. I remember there was a gang and they were accosting kids and robbing them of their lunch money on the way to school. And I was still in elementary school and I was walking to school with Teddy. Teddy, our back fence met Teddy's back fence and I walked to school with him. He was completely worthless. <laughs> I didn't know he was worthless until we got accosted by this gang. There were three or four kids, I don't remember. I'm sure I've told it years ago and remembered the number, but there were three or four kids and they wanted our lunch money. Well, Teddy, you know, he's worthless. He handed his money right over. And I told him, I said, no, I'm not going to give you the money. Well, we're going to beat you up. I said, I have no doubt. <laughs> but I said, I'm going to break one of your noses. I am going to make a bloody mess out of one of you. So let's do it. Which one's it going to be? And they looked at each other, and they looked at me, and they wandered off. And I ate lunch, and Teddy didn't. <laughs> but I learned a valuable lesson that day. You pick your ground, and you don't give an inch. And if you haven't figured it out, the devil's a bully. Yes. 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 And you can't give him an inch because he'll take a mile. Right. Right. You pick your ground and you stand your ground and you maintain your confession of faith and you don't, give, you don't back up a mosquito's eyebrow. Amen. And that's all in the natural. But we have the blood of Jesus and we have the name of Jesus. And at that name, demons, the Greek reads, they run as if in terror. They flee. But shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass and shall not doubt in his heart. 
but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. So it's conditional. For this person, this whosoever to have, whatsoever he saith, he must not doubt in his heart. He must believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, otherwise it won't work. But thank God the word is true. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Say it again. He shall have, he shall have whatsoever, he saith. whatsoever he saith. Now don't, don't, don't try and start at some nutty level and confess a billion dollars. I mean, it'd be great if it worked that way. Back on October 28, I just decided I was going to change my life. It would have been super if I could have confessed that I would be at my perfect weight by October 29. That'd be great. But life doesn't work that way. So a lot of times people self-sabotage because they hear a service like this and they want to go out and confess they're going to be a millionaire by Friday or they're going to have their house paid off by Friday. See, we have to, we have to work our way up through the levels of faith. It's amazing to me how many times people have a miracle and then they don't go back for a, a second. Years ago, I used this as an illustration, and I said, pick a number, just pick a number, a reasonable number. Then go to the Holy Spirit of God and ask Him how much money to sow as a seed for that number you have in mind. Sow the seed that the Holy Spirit tells you to sow, then believe God, put this into practice, and confess the money's on the way until you have it. And I'm thinking of a man and he and his wife and his children, they used to be here every time the doors were open. And he believed in, I think it was $1,000 or whatever it was. And uh, he, was, he came, he was, his heart was filled with rapture. He was so excited. But I never saw him repeat it. People don't think like I do. See, I learned from Dr. Frederick K.C. Price that once you discover a principle from the Word of God and it works, you can repeat that principle over and over and over because if it's a principle from the Word of God, it'll work every time and God is no respecter of persons. Amen. So if, if I could go to God and ask the Lord how much of a seed to sow to believe in $1,000 out of the blue, well, I'm, I'm coming back. I tell them all the time, I'm coming back. Sue says sometimes because of the way Austin and I pray, she feels sorry for God. I mean, I'm coming back. Yeah, but haven't you confessed in enough? I have only begun to confess in prosperity. So not only did he not repeat it, they're not in church. It's a heartbreak. How can you go to God, get an answer, get a miracle, and then walk away? It's amazing to me. Lift both hands and look up to heaven and say, Father God, Father God my, name is Jimmy, my name is Jimmy, and I'll take all you'll give me. Now, now we know we got to do some things. We got to live right. We got to tie it. We got to we got to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. We got to be doers of the Word of God. But I don't want to put a limit on myself. And and once I discover a principle that works, man, I'm gonna work it. I'm gonna work it, and I'm gonna work it, and I'm gonna work it, and I'm gonna keep working it. Amen. Amen. He shall have whatsoever he saith. And there is a scriptural principle here that works for everybody because Jesus said, whosoever shall say. Shout it out loud. I'm a whosoever. I'm a whosoever. whosoever shall say. So, so don't be sitting there thinking, well, pastor tells all these stories, but you know, he's the Lord's favorite. Whosoever shall say. This is a scriptural principle that works for everybody. That's why Jesus used the phrase whosoever. If this scripture wouldn't work for everybody, Jesus wouldn't have used the word whosoever. 
This will work for anything you can find, two or three scriptures to stand on, two or three scriptures that cover your situation. Say it out loud, whosoever surely meaneth me. Shout it out loud, whosoever surely meaneth me. Whenever I teach like this, people will come up afterward and say, I sure wish I could get that faith stuff to work for me. Well, faith doesn't work by wishing. Amen. Faith works by doing. Amen. Whenever I teach like this, people will come up afterward and say, well, I tried that faith stuff and it didn't work. Faith doesn't work by trying it. Faith works by doing it. Amen. Shout it out loud. Whosoever surely meaneth me. Repeatedly, the Bible says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. <laughs> you have to understand my perspective. Let's go back to the integrated church because, you know, I do pastor such a beautiful people. Amen. You have to understand my perspective. You know, I got... I got some white boy saying I can't do this stuff and then I got a guy sitting here tonight that's an African immigrant and just at, at, at one offering last year handed this church $90,000. And I, but, but let's go back to white boy. You know, white boy saying, well, I can't do that. You got to understand where I'm coming from. Say it again. Whosoever, Whosoever. surely meaneth me. Surely. You know, he's gone now, but the Lord told, gave Benson Idahosa some assignment, some great, big, huge, monstrous project, and Benson Idahosa was, you know, struggling with it, and he told the Lord one day, he said, you know, I'm just, a, I'm just, I'm an African, I'm black. And the Lord said, what? <laughs> and Benson Idahosa said, I'm an African, I'm black. And the Lord said, I never noticed you were black. Whosoever surely meaneth me. Amen. See, we come up with all these excuses and the culture is training people to come up with excuses. Right. I can't because I'm short. I can't because I'm fat. I can't because I'm white. I can't because I'm black. I can't because I, I wasn't born here. I, I can't because I have an accent. And, and if you listen to that world out there, they will give you 25 reasons you can't do this and you can't do that. But at Faith Christian Center, I'm telling you, you can to point to your neighbor. I know it's not polite. Point to him and tell him you can do it. You can do it. Point to the neighbor on the other side. I know it's not polite, but point to him and tell him you can do it. You can do it. Tell him. Point to him and say, I don't want to hear one excuse come out of your mouth. Talk to the other, one on the other side like you're their mama and tell him, I don't want to hear one excuse come out of your mouth. Repeatedly, the Bible says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. We don't have any authority to believe God for anything unless it can be found in the written word of God, the Bible, and in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Now keep in mind that these words fell from the lips of Jesus. For whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith, those things which he saith, shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Amen. To look at an example, let's go to Mark 5 and look again at the woman with the issue of blood. Mark 5, 25. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing better but rather grew worse when she heard of Jesus came in the press behind and touched his garment for she said, <coughs> for she said, for she said, everybody shout it out loud, for she said. For she said. Why do you think at Faith Christian Center when we have a prayer line, we tell people specifically, do not tell us do not tell me what's wrong with you. Because if you come up here, yeah, but you, you don't know what I got. I don't just have X, Y, Z. I got double X, Y, Z. <laughs> See, if the last thing you're rehearsing before hands are laid on you is the problem, 
he shall have whatsoever he saith. And it's a real discipline to get people to say, to, to, from the seat all the way up here, to say, to mutter, to say to themselves, when he lays hands on me, I'll receive, and I'll instantly receive. Amen. It's a challenge. Because they want to come and tell you what's wrong with them. It's not that we don't care, but we know that doesn't work. It's not that we don't care. Amen. We know that doesn't work. Right. Right. If it worked, people would be getting healed off Facebook all the time. <laughs> That's right. There's all kinds of stuff I wish worked, man. Hail and Mary, I'd be the hailingest married dude in town. <laughs> or rubbing beads, man, that'd be so easy. How many things don't work, but people keep doing them? They keep doing them. They keep, how about prayer chains? They keep doing them. They keep doing the same thing and expecting a different result. We can't, we got to stop that. We got to, we got to give up our ways, Isaiah 55, and we've got to start going by God's way. And if we got to give up our own thought process and our own way of doing things and, and go to God's thought process and God's way of doing things and we'll get God's results. Say it out loud. He shall have whatsoever he saith. He shall have whatsoever he saith. He shall have whatsoever he saith. And in verse 28, for she said, and Jesus said, he shall have whatsoever he saith. And this woman said, Mark 5, 28, For she said, If I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt. The word is gnosko. She came to know. She recognized. She perceived. She ascertained. She realized. She knew experientially something changed on the inside. She felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out from him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? And of course, his disciples were spot on. And his disciples said unto him, thou seest the multitude thronging thee and sayest thou who touched me? It was really a, a nonsensical question. But I want you to perceive by your spirit man what happened on that day without an act of his will, without a volitional decision, power left the Son of God and went into that woman. Yeah. It was not a decision that he made. He would, if he had made the decision, he would have known. Oh, pastor, he, he was play acting. Are you accusing the Lord Jesus Christ of theater? Who touched my clothes? Who touched me? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And he looked about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him the truth. He didn't even call her out. He didn't even look around and discern by the Spirit who it was. She came and fessed up. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. If you could only see who you are. Hallelujah. If you could only perceive by your spirit man who you are. God wants you to be so built up in your spirit, man. God wants you to be so built up in your faith. God wants you to be, have such revelation of who you are that you don't even have to run to him for every decision to know what to do because you will know who you are and you will know whereof you speak and you will have the knowledge and the ability and the faith and you will know that he shall have whatsoever he saith and you'll just start speaking the word to some folks yeah. yes. 
And Jesus will get the credit, the glory, and the honor because miracles will begin to happen. Amen. Remember that day up at I-30? Young couple, you know, they had the one child having a struggle, having the second. And by the Spirit, I said, about this time next year, and you know, oh, Pastor Gene, you know, okay, okay, okay. And, and I, I don't remember what I did, but I, I got loud. I said, about this time next year. Then she had it. All right. And it came to pass. And it came to pass. And sitting right here. And it came to pass. We don't have to live like Fauci. Amen. There's not one thing that quack has said in 12 months that has come to pass. Not one damn thing. <laughs> damn is a biblical word. You do not, I want you to see who you are. You do not walk this earth as other men do. If you have been washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and especially if you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit of God, you are not a soccer ball for the devil to kick around. You are not a victim of your circumstance. You are not just somebody that spits out excuse after excuse, but you decide whatsoever you desire and you let your faith rise up on the inside of you, and you put a governor on your mouth, and you speak the word of faith over your life, and whatsoever you saith shall come to pass. You can have what you say. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Shout it out loud. I'm not a victim. I'm not a victim. <laughs> It'll change your life. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're not scared little rabbits hiding under the bed from a virus, wondering what in the world the devil's going to do to us next. No. We are mighty warriors. We are the sons and the daughters of Almighty God. We have the Word of God in our hearts, and we have the Word of God in our mouths, and we speak, and it comes to pass. Amen. We're not standing around waiting to see what's going to happen. We speak, and then it comes to pass. Well, she must have believed what he said would come to pass because Jesus said, daughter, she must have believed what she said would come to pass because she said, she said, shout it out loud, she said. She said. I want you to get it. Jesus was not even involved in the miracle. Yeah, but... You know, Pastor Gene, you know, those were different days because Jesus was on the earth. Man, you need to read your Bible. Amen. You need to read the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit is everywhere all the time. Hallelujah. The power of God is present everywhere all the time. Amen. We, don't, we don't have a power problem like the state of Texas. We have a knowledge problem. We don't understand who we are. We don't understand our place. For she said. So she must have believed what she said because Jesus said, daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Thy faith. You know, I know. The devil knows. You know. I know. The devil knows. 
There's only one reason this 55 acres is here. There's only one reason this building is here. There's only one reason we got no debt. Because somebody believed God Amen. and somebody said. Amen. Yeah, but you know, we've been working, Pastor Gene, man. We've been working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But see, which came first? Because I believe God, Sue and I believe God, and we said, and the Lord thought, we better send him some, some people. Now, we better send him some money. Because, man, he's standing up there. I mean, the, 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 the government's not even allowing the dude to hold church. And the crazy dude is standing there speaking the word. The thought never occurred to me to say, oh my God, we got to go to the government and borrow money, you know, to pay our bills. I mean, the thought never occurred to me, uh, oh my God, what are we going to do? I'll tell you exactly what we're going to do. We're going to act like the Word of God is so. We're going to talk like the Word of God is so. We're going to behave ourselves like the Word of God is so. Amen. Amen. And, and we're going to stand our ground with the devil. And if he dares to stand, we're going to give him a bloody nose. And we're going to send him back to where he came from, bloody. Yeah. Because we, are, we do not walk the earth as other men do. Yeah, but Pastor Gene, you know, that church down the road is still not meeting. What, 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 is, what, is, what does that have to do with us? The fearful. You know, I go, I go out and walk before the sun comes up, and there's rabbits, and they see me, and they run as if in terror. I never did anything to a rabbit. But that's the way people are. They're just running around afraid. But we're not rabbits. We're lions. Amen. And we serve the Lion of Judah. Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Now let's put these verses together. Verse 28, for she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And Jesus, verse 34, said unto her, daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole to thy plague. Thy faith. I don't even know how many millionaires are sitting here tonight. And when they were broke, they didn't have two nickels to rub together. There's quite a number. <laughs> There's quite a number. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thy faith hath made thee a millionaire. Hallelujah. Thy faith hath built that business. Hallelujah. Thy faith. People come up to me all the time in the fellowship atrium and say, oh, Pastor Gene, we're so grateful, you know, that you taught us. And, 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 and I tell them, you're very welcome. But the fact of the matter is, you, you heard. The fact of the matter is, you believed. The fact of the matter is, you took action. And how many didn't hear, they didn't believe, they didn't take action? We have to have revelation of the Word of God, though, to do anything. And the sad thing is, in churches across the land, people aren't teaching the Bible. I don't know that I'm the last lion, but there aren't many. There aren't many. I know that. And what did she get? What was that talking? Jesus said, daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. So when she said, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed, what was talking? Talk to me, what was talking? Her faith was talking. And what did she get? She got whatsoever she saith. She got what she said. She got her healing. How did her healing come? As a result of her believing in her heart, saying with her mouth, and taking action on what she believed she said. Now, if it had been somebody in 2021, they might have heard a little bit of preaching and sat at home and watched online and said, uh, you know, when I touch his clothes, I'll be healed, and then never got up off the sofa, never put down the leftover pizza, never got up and took action. Like we dealt with a week ago Sunday. It's kind of hard for God to bless your labor if you ain't got no labor. 
It's kind of hard for God to bless your barns if you don't have any barns. Kind of hard for God to bless your storehouses if you don't have any storehouses. How did her healing come as a result of her believing in her heart and saying with her mouth and taking action on what she believed she said? Action on what she believed she said. What she said was her faith speaking, and what you say is your faith speaking. What she said was her faith speaking, and what you say is your faith speaking. You see, if you say something long enough, you'll eventually start believing it. If you say something long enough, you'll eventually start believing it. If you'll get this, you'll be on your way. When Sue and I got serious on confession back when it all hit the wall for us financially in 1989, we started confessing Philippians 4.19 every day. And my God will meet all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And later we started confessing 2 Corinthians 9.11. You'll be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And we started confessing these two scriptures every day, literally when we had nothing except what was in our retirement accounts. Sure, we had a home, and sure, we had two used cars, but it was all a house of cards built on cash flow. And after the Jimmy Baker scandal, and after the Jimmy Swagger scandal, neither of which had anything to do with us, the cash flow got interrupted, and we nearly went under. So we battened down the hatches. We got serious with God on confession, and the ship didn't turn in a day, and the ship didn't turn in a week, and the ship didn't turn in a month. But after a year's time, we could notice a little difference. And after two years' time, we bought our first brand new car. But after 32 years, I'm here to tell you, confessing what you want from the Word of God is the ticket to getting what you want in this life. After 32 years, I'm here to tell you, confessing what you want from the Word of God is the ticket to getting what you want in life. We had nothing. Our first big confession was the way we changed how we prayed over our food when we ate out. We would pray, thank you, Father God. We are so blessed we can eat where we want, when we want, and order what we want, and pay cash. That's how we got blessed, because we weren't splitting, you know, meals anymore. Order what we want. That's how ridiculously broke we were. We were so broke, we, we were confessing that we could afford to eat out. Today we're so blessed we could get on a jet tomorrow, fly to Miami to eat lunch at our favorite Italian restaurant, come home the same day, and think nothing about it. Hallelujah. That's what confessing the word for 32 years will do. I said that's what confessing the word for 32 years will do. But you got to police yourself. People always protest and say, well, what if I don't really believe it? And the answer is, say it anyway. Amen. Pastor, what if I don't really believe it in my heart? Say it anyway. If you say something long enough, you'll eventually start believing it. Because we're not talking about some theory or idea or some man's opinion. We're talking about God's word. We're talking about what God has said about your life. And God's word has power. Shout it out loud. God's word has power. God's word has power. You see, if you... <coughs> If you say something long enough, you'll come to believe it. If you say something long enough, you'll come to the place where you believe it. You know as well as I do, we all have relatives, and they have told a lie so often for so many years, they have come to believe their own lie. I mean, John Kerry probably actually believes in climate change, even though he owns five private jets. They probably believe that life begins when the baby comes out of the womb. They, they probably are not even aware of the science that a baby's heart starts beating about day nine. If you, we all have a relative and they've got a fish story and when they told it to you the first time, they knew that you knew they were lying, but they told it anyway. But now after <coughs> 10 years, when they tell the same fish story, they believe it. Politicians are like that. They've told the same bald-faced lie for so long, they actually be believe their lies to be the truth. But you see, when we find scriptures that cover our situation, 
and we find two or three witnesses in the Word of God to cover our situation, and when we incessantly repeat what God has said, we cannot tell a lie. And we come to believe it. We cannot tell a lie. If you will say what God has said about your life, you cannot tell a lie. I'm telling you, back at 89, when I changed the way I did offerings, and I said all of our needs are met. And then months later, I told the story. I heard Kenneth Hagin say, you got to be careful with Philippians 4.19. You can get stuck there. And I came back to Arlington. I did my own homework. And then I threw in 2 Corinthians 9.11. We're being made rich in every way so we can be generous on every occasion. There were people. There were even employees that knew our situation. And they said, you're lying. And my answer was, if I repeat what God has said, how can I tell a lie? And you don't know. You don't. You think you do, but you don't. There were meltdown days right here at Faith Christian Center, but I never wavered. I stood up and said, all of our needs are met. All of our bills are paid. We're being made rich in every way so we can be generous on every occasion. And we were going backwards and backwards and backwards, but we just held fast. We just held fast. We just held fast and God met us and God answered. We, it got to be so ridiculous, we made a list of the miracles. I mean, uh, $225,000, $250,000, $300,000. I mean, God just came along. I mean, just, I mean, just made it up. One miracle after another financially. Because we held fast to our confession of faith. But trust me, now when I say, you know, all of our needs are met and we're being made rich, uh, you know, this is some reality here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're blessed. Amen. This congregation Amen. is blessed. Amen. Hallelujah. Lift your hands and say, thank you, Father God. We're blessed. For she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And Jesus said unto her daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. So what she said was her faith speaking. And what you say is your faith speaking. I said, what you say is your faith speaking. And what you have to understand is when people doubt, they still believe something. And it's your confession that rules your faith. It is an inevitable law. It is the law of faith, and it works for you either on the positive side or the negative side. It is the law of faith, and it will work for you, or it'll work against you, but either way, it's working. It is the law of faith, and it will work on the positive side, or it'll work on the negative side, but either way, it's worth it working. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Someone told Kenneth Hagin once, that confession business doesn't work. To which Kenneth Hagin responded, now isn't that interesting? Your confession is it doesn't work. And that's exactly what you got. It isn't working for you. And that man looked Kenneth Hagin, kind of startled, batted his eyes a few times, and then I, he said, I see it, I see it, I see it. What I've got to do <clears throat> is turn that record over and play the other side. That's what that man in the wheelchair was doing to me all those years ago. He was rehearsing to me all the reasons faith doesn't work. Rehearsing to me all the reasons the healing verses in the Bible don't work. Rehearsing to me why he could never get out of that chair. And I'm trying to help him. I'm trying to help him. I'm telling him what the Word of God says. I'm telling him what Matthew 8, 17 says. I'm telling him what 1 Peter, but he wouldn't hear it. He wouldn't have it. Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report? I'm here to tell you tonight, if you'll believe the Word of God, you can change your life. Yes. If you'll let faith take root in your heart and you let the Word of God come out of your mouth, you can change your life. Amen. The Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. When you open your mouth, you are prophesying over your life. And it is your faith, it is your confession that either releases your faith or it is your confession that holds your faith back. Your confession sets the level of your faith. 
I think people think, you know, man, I got to go to church. I got to go to this seminar. I got to, I got to get more faith. No, you just have to learn how to release the faith that you've got. And confession is not the only way we can take action on the word of God, but confession is one way we can take action on the word of God. And Jesus answering saith unto them, have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith, those things which he saith, those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith.